Greetings Petroheads, welcome back to Automation and today we are going to do another review and it is a car made by another Automation content producer. It is Mouse Gunner and some of you guys might even know him already, in fact it was some, it was one of you who actually pointed his channel out to me. I can't remember who it was, but anyway he's got a 1956 coupe that uh, he would like to be reviewed. What I should make sure though is that the re suspension is solid axle coil, that's what he told me. So alright, we did that. Um, what else is there to say about the chassis? There is... it is a ladder chassis which is not unusual in 1956 anyway. Um, <clears throat> galvanized steel material for a little bit of extra, you know, prestige, a little bit better corrosion resistance and more cost, but not too bad. Double wishbones up front were very popular back then. Solid axle coil also uh, for, the rear, uh, for the rear end. Then the steel panel materials because alloy is just, it's nice, but it's too expensive for what it does. Looks are very classic 50s, very simple, lots of chrome in the grill um, and actually everywhere on the car. The tail lights are also very simplistic and you know the badge has wings just like on the on the Bentley or Aston Martin these days. So it, it looks prestigious, it, it does. Aside from the fact that it doesn't have exhaust but that you know a very minor concern. Now it is river drive as you would expect. Um, and as far as engines go like he has four trims here two of which share this 3.3 liter inline six. It's a push rod engine cast iron block and hand material cast everything and a border stroke ratio of 88.1 times 89.6 so pretty square but a little bit more on the stroke side of things 50 cam profile is maybe even a little bit too high because if you see if you look at the torque curve it's not very even it it climbs and then until about 3400 or something rpm there it, there it reaches his uh, plateau, but then again we're talking differences between 210 like here at 2100 rpm and 244 at 3700 so there's still a good amount of torque in the mid-range 141 horsepower is yeah, maybe a little bit low for, for a 3.3 liter, but then again it's 1956 and it's a pushrod engine so it's fine, it's not not too low. It is very lean so we might even see a pretty good fuel economy with this thing. Um, two parallel single carburetor looking like this is pretty simple. Not really gonna blow the doors off but it's also not gonna be expensive. Uh, 48 ignition timing that could be higher. What is the compression at? 8.2 yeah okay so that's an interesting um, way of tuning this engine because what the lower ignition timing does is it makes the power come in later at the power band and also the, the torque whereas a higher a higher ignition time timing makes it all come a little bit earlier when your ref limit isn't that high to begin with it might even be better well it definitely is better in most situations to have a higher ignition timing here a more advanced ignition timing as far as exhausts go short cast two inch um, single exhaust with one reverse flow muffler and no second muffler
the reliability strikes me as very good for 1956. Given that this is a pushrod engine, which is uh, the most reliable setup anyway, and also we have a low rev limit and we do not... Yeah, we have a little bit of valve float, but that's that's just to be expected in that age. Um, and also I'd like to point out that the production units of 22 hours is just is very very low which is good for the costs and economy is still not that uh, great but then again it's 1956 and you're not really gonna have an economical engine in that time anyway like no matter what you do basically so we get a four speed manual gearbox uh, geared to 217 kilometers an hour spacing is 48 that's pretty average uh, open differential because differentials weren't really that popular back then and even if like even if they really existed most most cars didn't have one and then sports tires it is a sporty coupe it seems and then we have 13 inch rims 185 millimeter rear tires that's a lot of tire profile <laughs> and steel rims then drum drum brakes with a 65 uh, brake pad type just to offset that inevitable brake fade just a little bit no under tray no downforce um, because we don't have lips do we? no cooling airflow is more than enough we do have only two seats, so it's a two-seater GT car, basically, it seems. No entertainment. And then standard 50 safety. No entertainment and only basic and only standard interior with two seats. So this is a pretty radical sports car, if you will. It's very it's gonna be very light for its size. Standard springs, twin tube dampers and patch sway bars with a pretty normal preset actually. It's not really that sporty. But um yeah, it, sh it should it should be very drivable. 19.8 drivability for 1956 is actually really good. That is mostly down to I think two things. A pretty well tuned um suspension with also a uh, good amount of free attire and also the fact that we're not making crazy amounts of power 141 horsepower you know it's it's only slightly more than what my golf diesel makes so you know it's it's not all that impressive of, uh, as a power output but then again for 1956 it kind of is it it, it, it is a powerful car for its for its time so the drivability is good. The total costs are very low actually. Which is probably because because of this uh, section right here. No entertainment, only standard interior and safety, only two seats and the fact that it's made of steel. So we do have an i6 uh, an inline 6 premium version as well. Uh, looks are identical. Engine is the same. So we still have an open differential. Uh, still the same setup here and here. Less cooling airflow for a little bit higher, higher top speed maybe. Yeah, one one kilometer an one kilometer an hour faster. Um, but what's really different is here, uh, the interior, premium interior, standard radio entertainment, and still st standard safety. Suspension is slightly, only ever so slightly revised. Um, and overall, the stats drivability is a little bit down. So is the spoilerness, but comfort came up by over 8 points. 
prestige came up safety came up a little bit reliability suffered quite a bit actually despite the fact that the engine is still the same and you know that's still just as reliable as before but we do now have some entertainment in here and also we have um what else was i about to say yeah less cooling airflow and that makes the reliability slightly worse but it's still good for 1956 costs are about 400 dollars more which is not too crazy but then we also have two v8 versions a normal one and a premium one so um those are also still the same aesthetically but let's look into this engine here it's a 4.1 liter slightly higher stroke than bore again as well as push rods just like before um casting terminals 50 cam profile 8.9 compression again a pretty pretty top heavy torque curve we have plus two quality in the in the head section here just to offset a little bit of that valve float naturally aspirated of course um, four barrel single carburetor it's a pretty popular thing back then uh, standard intake again 98 98 octane fuel with pretty mid-range ignition timing and very lean like all the way leaned out fuel mixture and 4700 rpm rev limit this is so this engine is set up very very similarly to the inline six um we got a single exhaust uh, pipe uh, with a short cast header and again only one reverse flow muffler and no second muffler this is a little bit too big isn't it 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 does provide more power though but less torque and the torque will come later so that's that is debatable whether you want a two and a half inch exhaust diameter only the two and a quarter inch yeah I mean it's it's fine either way it's, it depends on what you prefer personally I'd probably, I'd probably go for the two and a quarter inch because we you know you know would lose um we'd lose two horsepower which is not a big deal but we'd have the torque a little bit earlier more bottom end torque then again having more top end like more top range uh, performance means the performance index is higher and also we have two more horsepower which you know two more horsepower is two more horsepower you can't deny that top speed of 246 kilometers an hour and well that's the gearing at least it is estimated to do 233 open differential again sports tires again the same the same tire setup here as on the inline six you know you don't want to go too crazy on how small you want to make your rims i guess because 12 inch rims are ridiculous but they would be required for some wider tires here so that is why i can totally understand uh, why muscular did not uh, go, go for smaller rims No under tray, enough cooling, standard interior, no entertainment, standard safety. So this is um, very similar to the... Oh, this setup is actually the one he used on, on the Inland 6 Premium. So this is going to be just just like the Inland 6, like the standard Inland 6 version, only with a V8. Like everything else is basically the same. Drivability came down 
to 18.4 because we do have more wheel spin now. Uh, spoiliness came up to 7.9, which is isn't that like right on par with the normal in 96, or is that 0.1 score higher? The cost is lower. The cost is lower than on the premium in 96, which is kind of interesting as far as you know marketing goes. So how would you price? those two cars would you say okay the, the the v8 is more actually it isn't even more prestigious it's 0.5 uh, scores 0.5 points if you will lower in prestige than the premium in 96 so that's kind of tough to you know where are your priorities when when it comes to pricing the cars would uh, would you price the v8 higher just because it has a v8 and it's you know a more potent engine which is what usually car makers do today at least um, I don't know how, how that how that situation was in the 50s uh, or would you would you price the inland 6 premium a little bit higher because it does cost more to produce and it is more prestigious and more comfortable and better equipped just something to uh, something to think about I guess but we do have one more version which is the V8 premium which is most definitely gonna be the most expensive car in the lineup again looks are still the same which is fine and then we have the same V8 engine which is also fine then we have four four speeds again open differential same stuff here again the same setup here as well the cooling airflow is just just the same as on the normal v8 as well there we go premium interior standard entertainment like standard am radio <laughs> and 50 uh, standard 50 safety again and slightly higher damper stiffness than on the Inland 6 Premium and on the normal V8 so how, what does this do? 17.7 17 drivability is slightly lower but still fine um, 20.4 comfort so that's 2.1 comfort less than on the Premium Inland 6 which does raise the question of um, who would buy the, the, the V8 Premium if the Inland 6 Premium is more comfortable and the uh, the regular V8 is easier to drive and sportier well um, it does it is the most prestigious though as you would expect it is also going to be the most expensive one um, the heaviest one, the one with the worst fuel economy, but those are just pretty irrelevant numbers because they're not that that much higher than on all the other uh, trims. Reliability came down again because of the radio, I guess. <laughs> Radios like to break back then; they weren't what they what they are today. Even and even today, radios oftentimes you know stop working. So that's totally understandable. Utility is less, like lower than on the normal V8. It's kind of irre irrelevant anyway. Service costs is are pretty low even on this V8 premium version. Let me go to the regular in, in 96. That that should have like really low service costs. Yeah, 1205 in today's money, which is very low indeed so overall I would say decent car could use a little bit more a little bit more finesse on the engine side of things I think well not not make it overly expensive you know go for a six-pack setup or something like that no you, you can just leave that as it is but I would probably prefer 
and as would potential customers um, if the engines weren't that top range heavy if th th there was more low end torque because that's that was the that was the preferred setup of most engines of that time anyway like no matter whether you went to America or Europe most engines were like ridiculously bottom heavy and this one these ones aren't so it's a little bit out of the ordinary at least is, is it better or worse I can't say for sure but it is different and it is worth noting so I hope you guys enjoyed the episode if you did please click the like button it helps out a great deal subscribe if you want to see more in the future for now thanks for watching and I'll see you next time